If you're into beekeeping, you already know that sooner or later, you're gonna end up with the queen issue. Queen problems are frequent, and in today's video, we're gonna talk about the effect of temperature in sperm viability. Honeybee queens are known to survive in a honeybee hive for two, three, sometimes even four years. But in today's conditions slash practices, you're gonna be very lucky if you don't have to requeen your hive every single year. When a honeybee queen fails, we never really know the reason why. There is a lot of speculations about nutrition, about lots of different things. Uh, but a new study published in Nature Sustainability is bringing a new light to this issue. I'm Dr. Umberto Bon Cristiani, and this is Inside the Hive.tv, the show that takes you into the world of bees. If you like bees and want to know more about them, please consider to subscribe and also hit the bell button so you don't miss a single video. I invited the first author of the article, Dr. Allison McAfee, a postdoctor fellow at North Carolina State University and writer for the American Bee Journal, together with the last author of the article, Dr. Jeff Pettis, president of the International Federation of Beekeeping Organizations, Apimondia, to talk about their new research. The video is long and I advise you to get a beverage of your preference and a notepad because there is a lot of information there that can be translated to uh, practical beekeeping practices. We talked for a whole hour and I'm still feeling that we just scratched the surface of this article. So please be advised that I'm gonna be making more videos about the same article in the near future. I would like to congratulate everybody involved and thank them for the hard work to put this project together, especially beekeepers that always donate their time and resources. You can find a list of organizations involved in this video in the description below. I also would like to thank my Patreon. Without their support, it would be harder to make these videos to happen. Uh, with special shout out for DC Beekeepers Alliance. Please check them out, this beekeeping organization in Washington, DC. Check them out and see what this great organization is doing in our nation's capital. So without further ado, let's jump into the video. So how are you guys? Thank you very much for your time to come here to this show and give you a little bit more information about this important research that just came out. And I don't know if I told you, but the way I knew about the publication was with my phone buzzing. Beekeepers asking me if I could cover this one because they know they want to know more about the heat affecting their queens and especially in the state of Florida. So how that starts? Tell me about the project. How long it takes to generate this gigantic amount of data? Hmm, that'll probably take a, a team answer because there's a lot of data in this paper and a lot of it was acquired already by Jeff and I don't know when. <laughs> it's a multi-year, I guess I saw there was a lot of work involving a lot of different people, a lot of different institutions that we need to mention here to be, uh, I know, uh, Dr. Chapman, Dr. Higo, Robin Underwood, uh, Joseph Malone, Leonard Foster, Marta Guarna, David Tarpey. Yeah, I think I cover everybody, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So, very good researchers. Yes, Jeff. And, and all the beekeepers that contributed time and oh, yeah. cleaning and stuff like that. I have to give a shout out to Asher Honey Company down at, below San Diego, they were this hot environment where we put the thermocouples in these hives and it got to 45 degrees centigrade um, in in that area of California during the time we ran that experiment. It was it was incredibly, and, but anyway, the Asher Honey Company uh, for helping out with that. And it's just like most research, beekeepers are really, really good at donating time, equipment, and expertise to, to, our, to our experiments. So we have to thank them for that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, some of the data also was uh, courtesy of queens donated by members of the BCB Breeders Association. And there are, there's a long list there, so maybe too many to say right now, and I'm not sure if I could remember all of them, but they have. there's a shout out in the acknowledgements of the Let's paper. Let's do this then. Here. You send me all the information on everybody involved, and I put the link in the description of this video below. So everybody... Sure have access to everybody involved. Mm -hmm. All right, 
<laughs> I was looking at the paper after I read and I was thinking how am I gonna cover this in one video? <laughs> it's a lot of a lot of work that was done and we can get this conversation from many different directions. I will try to keep this in more in a beekeeping perspective for the beekeeper view. So the article, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me if I'm wrong, shows that heat can affect viability uh, of queens. And that was one of the main strong results that you guys got, right? When people are transporting, can you, I'm gonna give you access. Here we go, wow. Let's see. The Goldilocks zone, I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect, right? Not too hot, not too cold, right in the middle. Yeah, so what I have here is one of the figures that we published in the paper. And this sort of mess of lines is showing the temperature over time for, um, I think it was eight different shipments of queens. So what we did, and shout out to Marta for this because she was really behind organizing uh, this part of the project. What we did was we put temperature loggers inside of uh, packages of queen bees as close to the queens as we could. So it was right inside the package um, and then shipped them just as they normally would be shipped. Uh, most of them were by ground transportation, like by ACE courier. Uh, some were the Canadian Postal Service, and there was one that was shipped uh, via uh, air. It, so it, it traveled on air, an Air Canada flight from Edmonton to Vancouver. And we just wanted to see what the range of temperatures um, was during these shipments. And you can see there's a pretty big variation. Um, it goes all the way from 38 degrees for this one particular shipment, which was a uh, package transported by ground transportation. And down here, we have a, an inverted spike, I guess, down to four degrees Celsius that was shipped by air. And the really interesting thing is, um, you know, people often say, well, you know, do we really need to worry about temperature changing during shipments? Because it's usually shipped in the spring or the summer when it's pretty warm out. Um, the conditions aren't too extreme, but this particular shipment, the one that went down to four degrees Celsius was shipped in the middle of June. Uh, it was very warm out. It was a nice balmy summer night. The timestamp on that temperature logger tells me that it was immediately before I actually picked them up at the airport. And so they were not in the air, they were on the ground in the Air Canada warehouse. And somehow on this t-shirt temperature evening, they got down to four degrees, which was really surprising. So what that tells me is that they are really at the mercy of the shippers and handlers, what they decide to do with the queens, where they put them. Um, and we don't have any control over that. So this was surprising. And it, it tells me that, that even if it's a nice day outside, that doesn't mean they're going to be safe. Wow, that's a lot of variation. Uh, Umberto, while we're on that right quick, if you don't mind, I'll just interject. We, we followed a, a, a lot of additional um, temperature shipments th through the air. And we've seen this in, in the summer. We've seen these cold spikes. Not often, but we do see them. And the only explanation is either they're putting in a refrigerated area or the cargo hold of the plane is not being regulated well enough. And all of a sudden, they, you know, they're not regulating the temperature in the cargo hold or something like that. So we've seen cold spikes in, in a number. And we talk mostly about heat, but we do see these cold spikes, which, which can be different. Yeah. There is anything that can be done. You can try to figure that out or help because, you know, a lot we of people depend on this kind of transportation to, for their operation. Hey, I'm gonna. Pam's gonna love this. I, Project Tape SM funded some work, and I did a prototype of a shipping box. I don't have anything to show you, but it's a, a shipping box that would self-regulate the temperature. It would add to the cost. It would add to the cost of shipping, but it would it would temporarily offset heat or cold. It, it won't do it forever, but for a two or three hour period, it could automatically adjust and, and to and and help offset heat or cold. 
Uh, it hasn't taken off <laughs> literally just and so it's out there as an idea but the industry would have to get behind it and uh, and support it so it, it is an idea yeah i see i see a lot of different technologies going to need to come to the market soon you know the the, the beekeeping is growing and technology is coming in i i make many different videos about new technologies that are coming to the market soon or already are in the market uh so maybe you should do a video about that technology maybe to see if you can get somebody to support that or yeah it needs a little development just to 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 you know to we did a, a alpha testing showed that it's possible to, to offset the high temperatures and cold temperatures but it needs a bit more development to, to make it a reality and uh, and then the consumer the beekeeper that's receiving the queens would have to say you know we want them shipped in this manner to ensure their safety kind of thing so yeah hmm, that's really cool i didn't actually know that you're working on that project but that's awesome now i can say that when people ask me the same question <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it's project, project tape is him I, I did it i finished it about a year or so ago and um uh, and it is there, and I know actually there was interest from Ag Canada and some students in following that up, and uh, and maybe maybe there'll be something happening um, to follow up, and it would or a company. The problem is, it's you know most things in beekeeping are not a huge market. Yeah. If we're talk, we're talking about whatever shipping organs or something, you know, you know, there's a huge money investment in those kinds of things. The beekeeping industry always suffers because we're a small market. Yeah, it would it would really help if there was a secondary application, or maybe if if the primary application was something else that has the you know the interest and funds for it. So I'm sorry, are you picking up this? Um, it might be like a circular saw or something outside. <laughs> in your, in your, I can't hear it. You couldn't hear it. Okay, good. <laughs> We'll, we'll save the, but it, it is relevant to this, to what we're talking about with this paper, because there probably is a solution. Uh, it would take some changes in the queen, in the, from the queen breeders end. And, and that, this is actually a good point to say this. The vast, well, the vast majority of queen shipments are probably fine. But the problem is when you have a shipment that goes bad, unless it goes really bad and the queens die, you don't know it. So you get these queens in and they've, they've been heated or, or chilled and, and then get their inferior because they're low sperm viable. So, yeah. Yeah, they, they look exactly the same as any other queen if they've been temperature stressed. And I'll add to that too. We have yet to kill queens in our stress experiments. <laughs> they're very resilient. <clears throat> so you can heat them up to 42 degrees or even more and you can cool them right down. In one experiment, I kept queens in the fridge actually overnight and they still didn't die so wow. uh, they can survive through a lot but unfortunately their sperm doesn't and then when the colony eventually starts to peter out and fail you have really no idea why because there could be other things that happened to her maybe she was an inferior queen to begin with and you just are sort of left guessing at what happened Oh man, so there is no way to visually identify any damage if the queen was exposed to any heat or super cold. Hmm. No, not that anybody knows. Yeah, no. Hey, Umberto, I'm going to give the, the viewers a little bit of homework. We, we have to speak in centigrade because that's the way science is done. But just for reference, 10 degrees C is exactly 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So you see that this 4 and this 8 are, are pretty cold, getting cold. And 16 is 61, exactly 61 Fahrenheit. And I don't, I've got to look up 38. I, I'm trying to, I, do you know 38 conversion exactly? I, I was, know, I was it in yeah. another slide ah. here. It's about 100, 101, yeah. 38 degrees is. And 38, we're saying 38 is, is right at the top of safe, right? That's right. So yeah, that would be my question. So what? The, how was the experiment to define which is the range which is safe for the queen and the, the sperm inside the queen? Okay, let's go back some slides mm -hmm. <laughs> to here. And Jeff, do you want to take this one because you actually did the experiment for that, and then I can talk about the sure. data analysis more. Yeah. Thanks, Ali. Um. So we got one large shipment of queens in from one queen breeder. And of course, we, we pay for them. Sometimes they donate them. 
But then when we tell them we're going to heat them and kill them, I mean, it, it is a painful. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's painful for everyone involved. But we take a large shipment of queens from one. We ask actually they, they come from one mating yard. So the, the, the viability should be the same within that mating yard. And then what Ali's got up there, we subjected them to these different temperatures. And, and we even did time in some cases. So the middle you see there is 25. And that's what, and, and that we also may have uh, probably done some pre, pre ones before we ever stressed them. But that's about, that's actually a little bit low. It's like 70% viability on average. It's like, I'm just, I'm kind of ballparking it. We'd love to see it 85 or 90, but it's still not bad. But you see, as you increase the heat over towards 40, mm -hmm. and as you go down in temperature, the sperm is affected. So uh, we just we just hold them in an incubator or a, a, a like a refrigerator and set at those temperatures and for different lengths of time and created this temperature extreme curve. So I, I don't know, Ali, you want to add to that? I mean, this was a way of defining that range. What can queens stand? What temperature and not suffer sperm viability problems? Sure. Yeah. So this graph really shows how sperm viability changes with the temperature, but then the next question is, uh, how do we define what the upper and lower threshold temperatures actually are? Because it just continuously changes across the temperature, right? But what what's the threshold? Like how much of a loss of sperm viability is, is too much, essentially? And so to answer that, we actually did uh, another experiment. And the data I haven't plotted here, but the results of it, um, was that we found that an 11.5% drop in sperm viability is what was associated with queen failure. So this was done with uh, about 50 failed queens that beekeepers in BC donate, donated to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we compared that, their, their viability to about 50 healthy queens that the beekeepers also donated. And we found that the difference between the two was about 11.5%. So now we can look at this curve we've plotted with the, the change in viability across temperature and say, okay, what does an 11.5% drop intersect with in that temperature curve? So if you just follow that, um, that drop and see where it intersects, then that's how we come up with the safe range being between 15 and 38 degrees Celsius or 59 to 101 Fahrenheit. So it's essentially saying that uh, an 11 and a half percent drop is a drop that matters um, because that's what's associated with queen failure. So then outside of that range, if we get an even bigger drop, then we'll say that's not, that's not safe. Did, following up on what Ali has just presented that 15.2 to up to 38.2 being very precise. In Fahrenheit, that's almost exactly 60 on the low end, 60 to 100. And, and think about how often in the spring you're, you've got queens being moved around that is below 60. If you break pick them up or you put them in the truck and you forget about them or they happen to be set in the wrong place in the spring, they can certainly go below 60. So a lot of people, I know everybody I've ever talked to about this problem, they always think about heat. But, but coal can be an issue. Coal can be an issue as well. Mm -hmm. Especially for people up here in Canada. I'm actually in Canada right now. I'm not in North Carolina. <laughs> um, for beekeepers up here, you know, we are, we're establishing our packages in the spring in the middle of March in Vancouver. Uh, and it can get very cold sometimes in March. It's still, there's still a risk of frost even sometimes. So... Um, yeah, cold cold is something to be concerned about in addition to heat. The reason why we talk about heat a lot is because that is a better studied stressor in other animals, like we were mentioning in the beginning. And also because that is uh, linked to what we're expecting to see as time goes on and the climate changes. So the climate models all predict an increased frequency, severity, and duration of heat waves around the world. And uh, that means that there could be an increased risk of, of heat exposure in the future. Wow, quite interesting. 
So cold is also a problem. Mm -hmm. That's right. Do Maybe, sorry, there's a, this, this particular graph I really wanted to talk about as well. Um, because we talk about shipping a lot because that's where queens are very vulnerable to temperature changes, right? They, they can't really thermoregulate in those little cages and they're just at the mercy of the particular environment they happen to be thrown in. But uh, we have some data that suggests we might want to worry a little bit about actual hives as well. Um, Jeff also acquired this data. He's the data generating machine <laughs> here. I love field work. Um, yeah, this is why I love field work, but yeah. Yeah, I do too, but I also love making graphs. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe Jeff, if you want to describe what you did for this test. So we were looking for a time when colonies would naturally be in a very hot environment. And um, this particular was collaboration with Asher and Honey Company below San Diego in very Southern California. And they were concerned about shading their colonies and whether the drones were all going to be cooked. And I'm like, that's, that's, a, that's a question I have too. Uh, or the queens, the queens inside, can the, can the colony thermoregulate? So there's more work to be done with this, but very simply, we put these little small, I don't know if you can see, but they're little small thermocouples. And we put them between, they record every 10 minutes. We put them between every frame. So they're starting at, and it's 10 frame, 10 frame data and equipment. Mm -hmm. And we had them just record in three different hives uh, over like a three day period. And we picked the hottest days that recording. We also put one underneath the hive in the shade to record the ambient temperature that the bees were experiencing. And very simply, the outside frames got hot. The, the hive should keep it at about 34, 34 degrees C. And the outside frames begin to heat up as the outside temperature is heated up. And uh, they, they, but amazingly, the inner core, the around the, the brood nest, the bees could keep it keep it cool. They were able to bring in enough water to keep that inside core temperature around the brood cool. What I don't know, and I'd love to do, it's a great master's project. Are the drones smart enough to move into that cooler area? Because if you look at a colony where the drones are, they're on the outer couple of frames. And so we don't know. If the drones were outside on those outside frames, they may have been, their sperm may have been damaged. And um, so the, anyway, that's what this was about. We we ran it and uh, then Allie worked the data up. And it, But yeah, the hive itself can be a problem. They can't always keep it uh, under high conditions. They can't always keep it perfectly thermoregulated. So if I understood correctly here, I'm going to show the colors here so the beekeepers can perhaps understand the same way I understand it. So the blue means the ambient temperature. So the, probably the sensor was outside, correct? Yep. And then you measure in every single frame the temperature inside these three hives. Right. And the outside of the hives have more reddish color and in the core where the brood are perhaps are more lighter color like orange color so yep. and then you can see that the majority of uh, the brood area apparently or the or the uh, the frames that were in the center are kept more stable temperature but when you go start to go in the the frames more outside of the core things start to get a little crazy here with different variations following the variations from the outside and the main question here if I understood you Jeff is if the drones are smart enough <laughs> to be protected instead of to be in the middle of this fluctuating temperature that could damage the, uh, the, the, the sperm of them is, right. that, is that the, the main question here that's true, and Ali will probably make a good point here in a second. If you look at Hive 2 and Hive 3, mm -hmm. the red lines, there's, those outside frames in Hive 2 and Hive 3 heated up quite a bit. Uh, so you could damage the sperm inside those drones if they don't move further into the brood nest. That's one thing. The other thing that this paper clearly shows, and Ali did some more work on this, drones are susceptible to heat. Queens aren't. Que queens live. Drones actually die. The drones actually die when they get too hot. So... Uh, she did some additional experiments on the drones and uh, showed that they're very vulnerable to excess heat. They, they, can't, they can't take it. 
Yeah, it's kind of funny. It's almost like the way I think about it is that it's almost like when the drones experience too much damage to their sperm, they just keel over and die because they have no reason to live anymore. <laughs> Such a situation. We, we're useless. Yes, something like that. <laughs> well, no, actually, it would make sense that if they get to that temperature, I mean, they don't know that, but the sperm is already damaged, and so for them to die is a good thing. I mean, it, they, they're not going to then, you know, be going out and trying to mate when, when the sperm's in vital. They might have an evolutionary pressure there, because otherwise they become just consuming uh, resources and yeah. with no utility at all. So I'm, I'm yeah, exactly. They have some evolutionary pressure there for... That's something I'm really interested in uh, looking into in the future um, is if if there is some kind of pattern where with eusocial species, so things other than honeybees as well, like ants or maybe other bee species, if we see this same trend, then that would suggest that there's some kind of, that there has been some kind of evolutionary pressure to have this quality control mechanism. Yeah, I would love to do a little heat shock on the some drones and put them back to see if the hive kick them out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's an interesting my, experiment too. My first very simplistic thing was to to look at do they are they not smart enough because that's not that we shouldn't say that but do they actually as the out, so those outside frames the ones with the dark red lines as they heat up do they move away from that heat and move into the center of the hive and I don't know that because. When you examine a hive, you'll find the outside couple of frames are just covered in drones. I mean, they're mixed, but those outside frames is where they tend to hang out. So I'd love to do that first behavioral part. And yeah, there's even more. There's, there's a lot of other follow-up experiments that can be done. Mm -hmm. Yes, so many things can be done. Something else to note with these graphs, too, is in particular with Hive 2, you can see that... Uh, so this is one of the outermost frames. This is one frame in from the outside, and this is another frame in from the outside. So that's three frames in from the outside. You're still getting temperature spikes, in this particular case, above 38 degrees Celsius. And the reason why I think that is so important is because these hives were standard 10 frame deeps, but when we're producing queens, we usually use miniature colonies. Uh, so a mini nuke or maybe a five frame nuke. And if you're in a five frame nuke, you only have three frames in from the outside. That is the core. You can't get any more central than that. So then you start to think, wow, if, if there is a, a heat wave or some kind of extreme temperature and you have all these mating nukes out there with maybe newly mated queens, in there, then uh, those might be particularly vulnerable to uh, to heat waves. That's scary. Another thing that occurred to me is, well, um, the Ashers had asked me to do this uh, or to help help talk to them about it. But it's a very practical application for queen breeders. If they happen to be in an area where it's extremely hot in the summer, they should probably think about some shading for drone source colonies. I mean, that would be, and, and the same what Allie just said, the same could be true for the small mating nukes. I mean, in other words, when it gets to be really high temperatures, we don't know what's going on exactly. And that, that could be some of our issues with, with quality queens in the midsummer, is this heat issue. Mm -hmm. I do know, I've heard, I've heard people talk about those uh, styrofoam mini nukes. But they seem to perform better in the cooler temperatures. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they do in the, in the warm temperatures. So that, yeah. Uh, yeah, that would be my question. Should we invest in other technologies? You know, does it happen in nature, in a log hive, for example? You know, you know, people are coming back for Darwinian beekeeping now and try to put the the bees in a in a tree again. I, I don't. I, 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 it's hard for me to believe it. That kind of variation happens inside the tree. Yeah, exactly. Me too. Um, I think that. It, nesting inside a tree cavity, they would probably be much more protected because the walls of that cavity are much thicker. Um, I don't know actually what the average thickness is, but uh, but I know that it's thicker than a standard wooden box that we would use. So with a thicker wall, then you get more insulation from the outside temperatures. Yeah, of course, we don't want to use thick-walled boxes because that hurts our backs, right? Yeah. <laughs> but something like styrofoam, if it 
can be, um, if it's more insulating and it's obviously very light, then um, that's something to investigate anyway, to see if there's more protections and that kind of equipment. Yeah, I'm sure we can come up with some, you know, we have so many, you know, I have a collection of coffee cups with the insulations that you, it's so light and keep the temperature for, uh, for hours and hours. So if there's any mass, I, I think of some of these little things, questions like this is perfect master's student project. Yeah. I mean, this would be so easy to do. I do know that hive number two, where the, the three frames got warm, that was the sunny side. So, I mean, there's simple things. Shade would work, but certainly it's the, the that wood is not enough to shield the effects of a really hot sun. Yeah, even hotter than the ambient temperature. So that was accumulating. There was some kind of painting on that? The yeah, I, I think they were painted white, but but even, but even white was not reflective enough. They didn't paint them black. I know that. Yeah, yeah, that's what was, I mean, there is, maybe there is some kind of, you know, art. Uh, people very creative sometimes in hives. Mm -hmm. And these, the ambient temperatures were recorded in the shade underneath the underneath, hives. So that's it's, true. It, yeah, it's conceivable that the, the side of the hive that is facing the sun could get hotter than the shade underneath. Yeah. Which, I mean, that's what the data is telling us happened, but I guess I'm just saying that it's it's not an unreasonable result. Okay, let's go practical then. Let's imagine I'm a beekeeper and something happened. What's the tolerance? There is any experiment that was done regarding how much longer these queens can stay in those danger areas without being affected? There is you guys look at this? Jeff, do you want to answer or do you want me to? I'll let you answer, Allie. <laughs> okay. okay. Before we go there, there's two questions that always come up from the queen breeder side or from the, the, the people who are buying the queen. First is what, what are the extremes? What, what, uh, what, what are the extremes that you've seen and how often does it happen? And how often is, is a question, how often do the shipments go poorly? Um, the other is how long can they can they can they be subjected to this um, heat? I know I've seen damage in certain cases in as little as an hour, but I'll let Allie explain a little bit more. She's done, I think, a bit more of a time series. So. Um, I actually haven't. I was planning on talking about your data again, but <laughs> the data that we looked at before, <laughs> oops, sorry, I forgot where it was here. This data. Um, the full data set, which isn't shown here, actually, uh, Jeff tested three different durations of exposure from one hours, or sorry, one hour, two hours, and four hours as the length of time that the queens were held at those different temperatures. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have that panel in this presentation. I do have the figure that I can send you though. Um, what we saw there was that at one hour, there were no significant differences between the different temperatures. Um, so, you know, we saw some patterns where it looked like it was starting to cause damage at the 42 degree temperature for one hour, but with so many comparisons, it didn't end up being actually significant. So we can conclude from that that one hour doesn't cause a really severe um, reduction in viability. But at two hours and four hours, we did see a significant loss of viability at either end of the extreme. So it was pretty variable, that data. But um, the two hour treatments, uh, we saw a significant drop in viability at the lower end, so at the cold end. And for the four hour, just because of the variability in the data, we actually saw the biggest difference at the hot end. Um, so we we think from from what we can tell, we would conclude that the between two and four hours is is kind of the dangerous length of time. So somewhere more than an hour on average uh, is what it takes to to cause a drop in viability at an extreme temperature. So in Umberto, just a quick follow up. Um, if you look at that graph and you look at those little circles down, almost down at the zero at 10 and over at 40, yeah, we see this all the time. Certain queens in certain situations, even like at 15 degrees C, you'll get like 80% of the sperm killed. It's highly variable. And, and one of the things that 
Ali brings out in the paper is that this could be a uh, difference between the type of bee, and we'll, we'll call it bee races. Uh, mm -hmm. More than adapted bee might, you know, it might be different than a, one that was adapted to the Southern Sahara Desert or something. So we haven't, no one's looked at that. Another great master's project. Look at, we'll call it, I mean, for lack of a better word, racial differences in response to heat. It's a great question to ask. And it, there probably is some differences there. But we saw it in individual queens. Uh, some, you, you get high mortality and others, you know, it, it was just, it was just very, very, very variable, which makes it hard to work with, but that's biology. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the take home message, I guess, is that uh, for less than an hour, you generally don't have to worry too much, but for more than an hour, um, then that's probably a length of time to be concerned about. Yeah. I, I saw in the field some, some people living inside the car for hours, some boxes with no care at all. So, and they, no, I do this all the time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and as we pointed out earlier, you can't tell it. The queens can even get a little heat stress, and then after they come back to normal temperature, they look entirely normal. The same with cold. They'll completely, they look like they're dead. They're, they're, they've stopped moving, mm -hmm. and they're comatose. You warm them up, mm -hmm. and well, they're fine as in they live, but they're not fine. They're not viable. They're not working well. Mm -hmm. The other thing is if you introduce these queens, stressed queens into colonies and, and they're accepted and they look like they're doing like okay, um, that also you don't know what she might have been able to do if she wasn't stressed. So like in real life, we don't have a control experimental group to be able to compare these queens to yeah. like you can imagine um an 11 and a half percent drop in viability really isn't that much like if you just imagine looking at a brood frame you know would you be able to tell if, if there's well just it doesn't directly translate this way but would you be able to tell if there's like 10 or 11 percent less brood on a frame you know that's a pretty small difference to be able to pick up on just by observing a colony, for example. Um, but if you think about like small drops like that across say a whole apiary, if you think about the loss of, of population or loss of production at that kind of scale, then it becomes really big. But at an individual um, colony level and just as an observing beekeeper, that's something that's very, very hard to tell if you don't have like an actual experiment to be able to compare these things. So these kinds of effects, I think, really fly under the radar for most of us. Yeah, yeah that's important to mention that. I, I work with beekeepers with 30, 40, 60,000 hives. You can, if you're gonna put this in dollars, you know, if you're losing, let's put 5% of that, you know, the, the possibility that you could get, you're talking about millions. It's a lot of losses that invisible losses yeah yeah exactly Let's call that invisible losses like high high blood pressure you don't it's yeah, a, yeah, the invisible a silent killer yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. there is any experiment that because this was in queens uh, but could the queens get have get those mates from bad drones already there is maybe they receive uh, those uh, spermatozoids already damaged from drones that was exposed to different heat or cold in the past. Do you think they lost their ability to mate the drones if there there is heat shock or cold shock on them? Because that might be something to that I'll be thinking. Well, maybe maybe the queen got the heat shock or the cold shock, or she mate with drones that was already damaged in the past. Mm -hmm. that, that's a really, really interesting question and something that I'd really like to follow up on uh, in the future because there are, it's not entirely clear what would happen if the queen mated with, say, a drone that was heat stressed but managed to survive still. So, you know, we found that drones will often die if they're heat stressed, in which case, obviously, they can't pass on their damaged sperm anyway. But... Some of them do survive. So if those that survive then mate with a queen, um, what effect does that then have on, on her 
reproductive ability. And it's not clear what would happen because on one side, um, just because of the way that the sperm get into the spermatheca, you know, they have to actively swim in there. So that already would select only for the sperm mm -hmm. that are alive. But uh, a couple things. Some people think that live sperm can actually drag aggregates of dead sperm into the spermatheca. That's an idea that's been thrown around there. Um, it's not very well defined yet, so I wouldn't say we can be sure that that happens, but it could happen. Um, and another thing is that in other insects, what some researchers have found is that even if a male survives heat stress, uh, and then goes on and mates and has a second, you know, sires a second generation. That second generation has legacy effects from their father's heat stress. So the second generation actually has lower fertility also, despite never receiving the stress themselves. So that might seem kind of like black magic or something, but it's it's been found in a number of different species and with various kinds of stresses, even humans, we see that kind of thing happen as well. Um, the idea is that the stress on the father can create a, uh, a, a change in the DNA, not a mutation, but it just gets like kind of a different structure than it used to have. And that then can cause biological changes in his sons. Um, it's actually called transgenerational, um, transgenerational effects. And the technical term for how we think it works is epigenetics. But um, I don't know if people watching this would be too interested in that or not. But there it is, if you are. Some of them. Some of them. Word epi epigenetics, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, that might be involved in disruption of... Uh, I, I, I published with A.L. Maori uh, a couple, I think a year ago now, that apparently there is transgenerational RNAi, where there is little pieces of RNA that are transported to the next generation of bees. And we find out there is all kind of RNAs that the bees collect from the environment and put in little capsules and send to, and put in a royal jelly and send to the next generation. And we have absolutely no idea why. I didn't know you were on that paper. That is a really, really cool paper. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> It's a very small world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Umberto, before we go away from this slide, I want to make a couple of quick comments. One is um, there's a group, part of the group that worked on this paper has also been working. They work out of Beaver Lodge, Alberta, Canada, and it's Martha Guarna and Steve Pernal, and they have run some field level experiments with heat stress mm -hmm. queen. That work should be coming out soon. The take home message is that, yeah, the heat stress queens, there, there is an effect at the colony level. And what I want to say with this figure up here is that going way back in time, not way back, Anita, Anita Collins, a colleague of mine at at, uh, at Beltsville, I had the honor of working with her. Yes, I remember Anita. Yeah, so Anita took and and took sperm and, and killed it, froze it. And then she mixed it back with live sperm at different concentrations. So like, let's say 100% viable, you know, good, good sperm, 75% viable, 25% dead, and then 50-50. 50-50 mm -hmm. was important. Then she artificially inseminated queens with those ratios. And when she got to the 50-50, which you see is a lot of those in the blue and the red range, when she got to the 50-50, she started seeing really poor brood patterns. So uh, we, we probably can see that some of this damage would be expressed in brood patterns, but well, more work be, is being done on that. And uh, her, her experiment, she, she always said that once the viability got below 50%, you could expect poor, poor brood patterns. And I think that's borne out by this and hopefully by the work of Warren and, and, uh, and Steve Pernal. Um, so we'll, we'll see that coming out soon, I hope. I mean, it's, it's a very practical thing for the beekeeper. Uh, if Oh, we got to give a shout out to uh, our colleague on the paper, Dave Tarpey. They run what's called a, and I cannot, cannot say it, queen clinic. It's very hard to say, right? You know, like, um, yes. A queen clinic, and several of the queen breeders around the around the U.S. in particular ship queens to them, and they can give they can do sperm viability and all a bunch of other measurements. Um, but sperm viability being one of them, this is very important. 
And so if you have a batch of queens that you're producing in the summer and you have doubts, contact Dave Tarpey at NC State University and the queen clinic will run queens and give you a, a, a health report on those queens. It's a very good way of checking um, the health status, especially for the queen breeder. It's a, I think it's really important to do some of these quality control checks. If everybody wants more information about that, I already made a video and you can find right here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I help uh, David Tarpey. They're doing a fantastic job there. And I think it's a, a kind of service that people are not using the way we're supposed to use. That data is, is I think it's gold for queen breeders to make sure their, their operation is running okay. I'll tell you one quick uh, mating story. So we did some stuff out of Beltsville, and I want to tell you what part of the country. We went to the same mating yard in July, and we looked at a bunch of queens. One year in July, the queens had 90 to 95 percent viability. The next year in July, the queens had like 40 to 60 percent viability. Same mating yard, same queen breeder, and everything else. And it's all the thing we could relate it to was weather and we didn't have we, weren't, we didn't set up the experiment to do that but it was all the same stock all the same practices all everything and one year they had really good high viability the other year from that particular yard they had poor viability and uh so i'm just saying that this is another reason why you should use the green clinic it's, it's a great service I, i've reported in the past on shipping queens from the same queen breeder by different methods and in, in the spring, one queen breeder who was down in the 60s, in the, in the summer, his viability was up in the 90s. So you, you, you just don't know without, ah, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah, this is, this is, this is different. Um, so if you look at breeder number four, and, and uh, for a beer, I'll tell you who breeder number four is. <laughs> I, never, I never reveal so you look at breeder number four, the average is 60% viability. Look at breeder number two. You want to buy all your queens for breeder number two, right? I mean, 90% viability. What I'm trying to tell you is that breeder number four later that same season was back up in the 90s. So things change. It's weather. It's temperature. It's I don't know what it all, all it is, but it's not always consistent. So, uh, yeah. Beekeepers are realizing that. Uh, some I have a couple of beekeepers that hire me privately to set up small labs in their operation. So I, I teach all this so they can have a, their own uh, measurements. Uh, some of the beekeepers are investing uh, in, to have a in-house uh, mini lab so they can perform part of this um, measurement. Which the is diagnosis. very very interesting. I think the future is. Is interesting for beekeeping. Yeah, yeah. And so like, the temperature thing, breeder number one, the UPS shipment in that it's had a uh, had a. Yeah, temperature. what's going on here in this graph? Because that counts too. How are we gonna? Sh what providers you gonna choose? Is it better? No, 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 no. no. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> let's go with FedEx. Come on. No, FedEx won't carry live animals. We have two two options. Well, no, you have three options. The third option is go pick them up yourself. And that's actually not a bad option. No. Go, go pick them up. Uh, you do that with package. We do that with package fees. This was, I took the same queens. I just took 20 queens from each of these six breeders, and I asked them to ship 10 of them by UPS and 10 of them by U.S. Postal Service. So the bar should always come out the same. But in fact, that one UPS shipment had, a, had an event. Uh, one out of whatever that is, that's uh, 12, 12 shipments. So, and back to the how often does it happen? I don't want to say yet. I mean, we're still gathering some of that data, but it's not, that's one out of 12. And I've seen it more often than that, I will say. I've seen hot and cold events more often than that. And I think in the paper, Allie, I don't know how often you're reporting that. Yeah, you, you did about 16 or 20 shipments, I think. I'm, I don't recall. And that one, that was the first graph that I showed. And there, uh, I think there were only eight shipments. And that one did drop down to four degrees for um, for a long enough time for it to be damaging. And another shipment got up to 38 degrees, but that wasn't for long enough, uh, I, if I remember correctly. So one out of eight is still, um, you know, that's not infrequent, really, in the grand scheme of things. Oh. 
And this is and just imagine if that shipment was carrying was carrying a hundred queens or yeah. two hundred queens. You know, that's a lot of damaged queens. <laughs> that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So, from outside, you cannot see anything. There is any way to figure it out molecularly? Yeah, so that was one of the major goals of the paper was to try to come up with a diagnostic test for uh, to be able to see if this kind of uh, stress event had occurred. And sort of a caveat is that right now we don't have a way of testing for that without killing the queen. So the reason why I think that may still be useful is because if a queen fails and a beekeeper is going to pinch her anyway, then just instead of pinching her, they can send them to me and I can tell them, hopefully, if, if their queen failed because they're exposed to too much heat or too many pesticides or if they got too cold or, or something like That's that. Great. So. Yeah, so I'll be, I want to be really clear, though, <clears throat> what we've found right now are these five candidate markers, molecular markers for heat stress. We have not yet validated those in the field, okay. um, and I'm currently working on expanding that to look for cold stress and pesticide markers as well, but we aren't there yet. So just so that everybody doesn't try, now send me all their failed queens. I'm not ready yet okay. to, to do an official lab test, but that is sort of the driving uh, motivation is to one day be able to look for all these different molecules and then tell the beekeeper um, <clears throat> what the most likely cause of failure was. It's kind of like a molecular autopsy. My colleague Bradford came up with that term and I really liked it. This is great, that's, this is bad. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great. Yeah. Yeah, so the idea is um, kind of like, you know, it sounds weird to, I guess, say we'll measure these proteins in the queen and that tells me what happened to them in the past. But really, if you think about it, it's kind of like like these, these uh, serum tests that you can get for if you've had different diseases like COVID. That's something that yep. um, that people are, are testing for a lot of right now. Uh, that test is just looking for certain proteins in your blood and the presence of those particular proteins indicates that you were exposed to the virus in the past. So in a very similar way, the presence of these five proteins that, that we have identified tells us that the queens were heat stressed in the past. It's the same kind of concept. Yeah, it's great. Uh, beekeepers need answers. Uh, I'm, sometimes I'm really tired to go in places and do not have, you know, straightforward answers for them. So I like this kind of research that start to narrow down things that we can come up with. Look, your queen or your hive died because of this. And we are, you know, absolutely sure this is the evidence. We measure this, this and that. We need more research to the, to provide answers because beekeepers got mad. And I think they have a reason for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe one day we can move towards some kind of precision beekeeping, you know, where you, you can get these kinds of answers and then make evidence-based yeah, management. I'm, I'm doing similar, not similar, I'm trying to get connected with the vet people that have a lot of resources regarding uh, tissue analysis. So we, we want to start to do some kind of uh, Sherlock Holmes kind of autopsy and f figure out a ways to have markers to be more precise to tell the beekeepers, look, your bee died because of this. We have all the resources, we test all of this and it's this, pesticide, virus, whatever, combination. Uh, I'm trying to get research to, to that direction so we can provide more answers, precise mm -hmm. answers. Yeah, we're kind of feeling around in the dark right now. Yeah. Uh, something else, a really interesting observation I made when we were talking just a little while ago about uh, queen producers using something like the queen clinic to kind of assess the quality of the queens that they're producing. Um, I have found in my experiments that somewhere around 2% of the queens that I order from producers are actually virgins. And I won't say where I got them, but... 
that was uh, astounding to me. And you, you know that it's a virgin when you dissect them and actually look at the spermatheca because it's crystal clear. So it's just spermatheca fluid in there, which looks like water. Um, a mated queen will have a cloudy white sort of creamy solution in there because of all the sperm. Mm -hmm. And 2% uh, of the queens that I've looked at didn't have any sperm at all. And so I think I'm only guessing here, but I think that with these really large scale queen producers that you just, um, there's not the same level of, of attention, I guess, to, uh, to detail that you might need to say, okay, yeah, there are all these eggs in, in this, <laughs> in this nuke. So the queen was definitely mated. Um, the odd time, I think that, that a queen is pulled when she hasn't yet, um, actually mated. So if you receive a queen and the colony just peters out, it, it may not be you. It <laughs> may be that the queen wasn't, wasn't fully or at all mated in the beginning. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Very interesting. So my supplier has started giving me 2% of my queens for free. Oh. <laughs> okay. So you got a deal. Yeah, that's right. A follow-up to that. I mean, they do, in the queen breeder's defense, they look in the nuke and they look for a patch of eggs. And But it really depends on the quality of your help. And sometimes when they're under pressure and they have new help and stuff like that, they don't always, you know, they don't always catch that. The other thing they try to do is you'll get queens with a, a bad leg or a bad wing or something, and they usually try to pinch those. But again, it's uh, queens are in high demand right now, so there's a you know there's a, a balancing act there. They're trying to get queens out as quickly as they can, and it probably depends on the quality of the help that they're able to. Also, in the queen producer's defense, bees do surprising and weird things sometimes, and it's possible that a mating nuke could somehow have two queens in it maybe and perhaps one of those you know they should kill each other fight it out till there's just one or um you know there should only be one queen cell dropped in there but if somehow a mating nuke had a rogue queen cell or maybe another queen um flew into another mating nuke who knows uh surprising things can happen so it's possible that a nuke could have two queens in there one of them is is has mated and is laying some eggs that somebody observes and they say, great, this queen's mated. And then they pull the queen, but it was actually a rogue virgin or something like that. That is another scenario that could happen. Every day learning something new. <laughs>